Hello, I'm Dave Harrell. Today I'm on the banks of the Warwickshire Avon at one of my favourite venues, Twyford Farm, just above Eversham. I'm going to be fishing today on one of my favourite methods, the waggler, with a view to catching dace, a few chub, perhaps even one or two roach. Without further ado, let's have a look at some of the pegs. I'm actually on a stretch of water known as the island. Over the years, this particular stretch has seen many big weights, uh, mainly chub weights. I can recall being here on one occasion where every angler over the course of 10 pegs caught over 20 pounds of fish. It's changed slightly over the last few years. A lot of the big chub have either died off or moved out of the area. In their absence, it's been replaced with lots of dace, quite a few roach, there's still a few chub here to be caught. These are the pegs that I tend to favour when I come down pleasure fishing on this water. This is peg 15, probably one of the shallowest pegs on the whole stretch. As I look across, there's a little bit of extra water on, we've had some rain over the last couple of days. Uh, there's a fair bit of boil on the surface, I know there's weeds underneath there, I can see one or two lily pads just, just pointing up towards the top of the water. Fair bit of pace down the centre. I don't really fancy this peg today, I think if the river had been a little bit lower and steadier, perhaps it would have been good for a weight. I'm going to have a look a little bit further upstream where I know the river gets slightly deeper. Let's have a look at peg 16. I've had uh, a close look at peg 16. It doesn't seem much different to peg 15, to be honest. There's lots of balls across the river again. Um, very shallow, I can still see quite a few weeds there. I don't really fancy that for a pleasure session. This looks better. As I look across the river now, the far bank territory has changed a lot. Uh, on 15 and 16, we had a lot of weeds, a lot of reed beds sticking up. Now it's been replaced by bushes, overhanging branches. It's a natural haunt for big chub. Uh, I'd like to get one or two of them today, so I think I'm going to fish in this area. I've looked up to peg 18 and I've seen one or two fish top already. That swung it for me. I think these two pegs are probably much of a muchness. By fishing peg 18, I've got that peg and this peg to go at. I've got the best of both worlds. I'm going to have a closer look just to make sure it's comfortable. Because we are pleasure fishing, I want to be comfortable. That looks absolutely perfect. Another fish just come up across there by the branches. Yep, this will do fine. I'm going to go and get some tackle set up. Right, we've got ourselves comfortable now. Let's have a look at some of the floats we're likely to use on a water such as this. I make all my own floats from peacock quill. Although you can get very good floats from tackle shops nowadays, I still tend to favour making my own. The reason for this mainly, I fish lots of different waters over the course of a season and I'm faced with different depths, different species of fish and by making my own I can cover a, a wide range of situations. As you can see from the box at the side of me, this is just a few of the floats that I own, uh, there's something there to cover all eventualities. Um, if there isn't, I'll go home and make it and eventually I end up with large supplies of wagglers. The two types of waggler that I use mainly are these. We've got the inserted waggler and the straight peacock waggler. <clears throat> I'll talk about this one first. The actual construction of the float is a piece of peacock quill here with a very thin peacock insert in the top. The reason for this is to register bites of very small fish just beneath the surface. The, the way we shot these floats up is as follows. We use a small flexible silicon rubber float adapter, which attaches like so. That then goes onto the line, locked with shots either side. The shot in, I would have to register to there. Beneath that, I would be using something like two or three number eights, which would actually take the float down to the orange insert. As I said, this float is mainly for use in the top layer of water. If I'm fishing a swim, 
Um, six foot deep, I may use this at three foot, four foot. It would not be used for fishing the actual river bed. This is when this flight would come into it. During the winter months, uh, after we've had rain, the river obviously carries extra pace. And sometimes, when the temperatures are low, we need to drag shots along the bottom. Using that float <clears throat> would be no good at all. That insert would be far too thin, and it would simply drag under as the shot registered along the river bed. All we'd do then, take that float out, attach the straight float, and quite often on this one, we would use a lot more shot down the line. Sometimes I would use the equivalent of five or six number sixes down on this particular float with a number eight on the hook length, which I would look to run along the bottom of the river bed. That then covers the two main floats that we use. For rivers such as this, I don't use bodied floats. Uh, I know certain anglers that do, but for my type of fishing, I would rather use a longer or fatter piece of peacock. Right, let's have a look at our rigs. I've set up two float rods today. They're both identical. They're both 13 foot borons. The reels are the same, and I think that this is very important to any aspiring matchman. I see lots of anglers uh, setting up a waggler rod, a stick float rod, a heavy waggler rod. I tend to use the same rods and reels for every situation. The reason being that when I pick up another rod later in the session, the balance is the same, the lines are the same, and it enables me to fish comfortably in the knowledge that I can give a certain amount of stress to each rod and it's exactly the same on each one. To me that's vitally important. On the reel today you'll notice I'm using Abu 507s. Unfortunately these are no longer made. Um, I happen to own six of these now and anybody out there that's got any more spare uh, you know where to come. I modify them a little bit on the sprawls. You can see from that, I had some special spools made up to fit the reel. They're very shallow, they take 60, 70 yards of line. I don't like to put much more than that onto a close face reel because of line bedding. And for a water such as this, 70 yards is ample. We're never going to hook anything that's going to take 70 yards of line off. And if we do, then I don't think we'd have much chance of getting it back anyway. I'll just put that back into place. What I always do before I start a session on a river, I like my lines to float. So I always apply uh, a small amount of silicon line spray. There's several good makes on the market now. And all you do with this, give it a good shake before the start, and actually spray the reel up. This enables that it achieves two things. The line floats well on the surface of the water, and it also takes out any friction on the line. When I'm playing a big fish, the last thing that I want is line grating through the reel, through the rod rings, and causing stress on the line. We're using fine line here today, it's two pound. It will be very easy, after a little bit of abrasion has taken place for the line to snap on the reel, on a particular ring. Uh, if it's a big fish, then it could cost us the match. I don't want that to happen. The actual terminal tackle of the first rod, this is our inserted float that we spoke about earlier. I lock the float with the bulk of the weight either side of the float adapter. You'll see in this particular case I'm using the new non-toxic shot, shot which is called Double Cut made by a company called Anchor. I've only been using this a small time, a small amount of time, but I found it perfect for the fishing that I do. It moves well doesn't damage the line, I think it's as good as lead. You may also notice that in, incorporated in the bulk shot, I've actually got some very small number eights. These also move around with the bulk shot. Down the line, we have three number 10 shots. We also have an option, because we put the small shots around the float earlier, 
we have an option to bring these number eights into play at any stage in the match. For instance, you may be fishing a match and small, hordes of small fish may be on the surface of the river. You may want to get the bait down quicker. All I would then do is take down two or three or even four of these small number eights to meet up with one of the other shots down the line. Three number eights together. One number 10, and another number 10 on the hook length. As you can see from that rig, I can fish between three and seven foot deep and cover a wide range of shotting patterns. Sometimes we may fish this rig as shallow as two foot deep, in which case I might only have one number 10 shot down the line. But we have a facility because we built the small shot into the bulk around the float to fish up to say seven foot deep with this particular float. Because it's a very, very fine float, very sensitive, it doesn't take a lot of shot, I wouldn't fish depths much over seven foot with this one. Once we came over that depth, we'd be looking at something bigger, which we'll go on to now. My second rig that I've set up today, very similar in construction. You'll see 13 foot rod, it's a boron, Abu reel again, same, same reel line which is two pound omni. I've sprayed it all up. The beauty of this line is that I find when it's windy such as today's conditions, sometimes it goes a little bit calm. I look out other times it's windy. With this type of line, I can actually cut it down below the surface, which I'll show you later, and actually sink the line. At other times, when the, light, when the wind's steady and it's smooth water on the top, I'll leave the line floating. The actual float is very, very similar in construction. It's a slightly thicker piece of peacock, a thicker peacock insert, and again, it's locked with our non, the non-toxic shot by anchor. In this particular instance, We've got two AAs locking and a number one making up the bulk weight. Down the line on this rig, you'll notice I have three number eights together straight away. Similar to the original rig where I could move the shots around, I'm starting off with this one with shots down the line. I've fished this area before and sometimes you can catch fish on two rigs and rather than moving about with shots, I'll set the two rigs up at the start and switch between the two during the match. For instance, I may be catching on the light rig three foot deep and all of a sudden a boat might come through. When this happens, rather than change the shotting around on my original rig, I'll pick this one up. Because the boat's come through, the fish have been pushed down in the water, I'll pick this up and perhaps take an extra four or five fish. Constant feeding will then bring the fish back up onto the surface, in which case I'll switch back to the original rod and start catching again on that. You can see from that, three number eights, one number ten, and one number ten, and another number ten underneath it. What I'm going to cover now is the actual way we attach the hook length to the line. There's lots of different ways. Certain people I know use loops, other people use blood knots, etc. Uh, a few years ago, I was fishing a, a courage practice session down at Eversham, just three miles away from here. And I always used to use two loops one loop through the other with a hook length attached. And Kevin Ashurst, who's probably my hero in fishing, came down and bit the actual loops off my line. And he showed me a knot, and I'm gonna show you now, that hasn't let me down at all. I've been using it for four years, and to me, it's unbeatable. This is how we tie the knot. Two pound main line, and today I'm going to tie on a one pound breaking strain hook length. Take a length of line, 18 inches, two foot, and not too concerned which. Bite it off. Join the two lines together, lay two ends together with a length of around about four or five inches. Form a complete loop around the fingers. Pass the two ends through once. Through twice. 
tighten. As you're tightening the nut up, just wet it a little bit. You actually left them with two loose ends. This wind's fun doing this. What I do then, <clears throat> you can actually bite those two, two ends off, but to make a nice clean finish, I use a small pair of nail clippers. Very useful in fishing for cutting lines and bits and pieces. Just trim the loose ends off. You're actually left with a very neat knot. There's no spinning through the water, as you get with loops. It's as strong as any knot I've ever used. And I can truthfully say it has never ever let me down in the times that I've used it. If I get a break, normally, if I have to pull for a break or a fish does break me, it normally occurs lower down the hook length, either on the hook or just past it. I'm totally confident with a knot like that. The next process in tying this particular hook length up, we're now length, left with a length, 18 inches, 2 foot in length, to which we attach the hook. And today, on this particular rig, I'm going to tie up a size 19 90340. It's the new Mustad range. Uh, on the other rod, I've got a size 21. That's to a pound bottom as well. On this one, it's a slightly heavier rig. We could get some bigger fish. Uh, I'm going to start off by tying a size 19 to that. This is how we do it. I use the, the Matchman hook tyre. Lots of people do it by hand. I find this a very, very useful gadget. Takes a bit of practice. Uh, when you first buy one, you'll be all fingers and thumbs trying to get, get used to it. But after a while, it becomes second nature. And I, I think I could all, almost tie a hook blindfold one of these now. You actually fix the hook in with a clamping device, which is a little screw on top of the hook tyre. We then have the wire push through. As you can see it slides. You push it through with the two hooks showing out that way. The actual tying process itself, you take the main line in one hand, I'm left handed, uh, right handed people might do it differently. You lay the line against the two wire loops. You pass, you turn the, the winder once and you actually pick up the main line and push against the spade. You always want the line coming off the inside of the spade, which I'll talk about once I've finished tying the hook. Once that's located onto the spade itself, turn on, very slowly, 10, perhaps 12 turns. Again on that, I know people that only do 2, 3 or 4 turns. They're happy with it and they don't lose fish. You'll have to sort out which suits you. Once you've got 10 or a dozen turns on, you take the main line and pass it back through the hook. With the other finger, push the hook down, and the hook is actually tied now. All we do is take the main line which is leading back to the float, and slowly tighten the whipping up. That is now tied. All that remains to be done is to release the clamping screw. We have the hook there. This is the critical part. Many anglers at this stage hold the hook length. They pull it through, that bit falls through, they've got a hook tie but they end up with lots of little ravels there. The secret to stop it, particularly with fine lines of 12 ounce or less, is to actually hold the hook. Slide the whipping, the end piece, through underneath your fingers. Like so. Tighten the whippings up slightly by hand and we're left with a hook tied with a long end on. We then go back to our clippers, snip off the, the loose end, not too close to the whippings because if you haven't tied it quite correctly, the whippings can unravel quite easily. Cut it off something like a sixteenth of an inch spare. That then is our completed hook length. I don't fish with fixed lengths. As you can see from this, today I've tied around about 18 inches in length. Sometimes if I'm fishing very shallow, 
I may even fish with a 6 inch or an 8 inch hook length. I don't like putting shots on the hook length at all. Um, if I'm stick float fishing, again I fish with very short hook lengths and I have the small shot just above the knot. Today, for this type of swim, we've got 18 inches. We'll now move that number 10 shot back down the line to settle against the knot. That's about 18 inches from the hook. Above that, we've got another number 10. And above that, we've got our bulk. That's the rigs made up. We're now ready to start fishing. First of all, we're going to talk about bait. Because in my opinion, one of the most single most important things in fishing today is bait. Without good bait, all this good tackle is worthless. Let's look at what we're going to use today. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about maggots. I've brought along today four or five pints of bronze maggots. I buy them from, from the local tackle shop. It's bronze, a few reds, odd yellows in there. I like different colours in the bait because it gives me alternatives when I'm fishing. I might catch a few fish on bronze maggots to start with. Later on in the match when the fish become a little bit edgy, uh, it gives me an option to change over to red maggots or a yellow as a change bait. It doesn't always work but occasionally it brings one or two bonus fish at the back end of a match. As it's summertime, although you wouldn't think it looking around at the weather we've got today, we've had rain and wind and all sorts, some of the bait, I bought this the, the weekend, some of the bait has turned to casters. That is the chrysalis of a maggot. I've got one or two skins in there. And I don't want these going into the swim, I want good clean maggots. So what I'm gonna do is riddle the bait off and show the process that I do. As you put the maggot on the riddle, shake all the old maize through and run the bait through. As you can see, straight away we're left with a few dead skins, a few casters, bits of grass and all sorts of things in there. I don't throw bait away at weekends. If I've got some left after a match, I'll keep it in the fridge. And providing it's not more than three or four days old and it's not shrunk down too much, then I'd use it again for the next competition. If I'm left with a situation like this, the only alternative is to riddle the bait and get it clean. You can see, rubbish on the top. I'll throw that away with the old maize and the old sawdust that was in it. Add a handful of maize to the actual bait. Maize meal flour is a very good degreasing agent. Cleans the bait up, helps it to sink easily. They look good. Compared the two, if I was a fish, I know which one I'd go for. That one every time. Today I've also brought along some casters. And this is a handy little tip for keeping casters for a prolonged length of time. Usually when you buy your casters from a tackle shot, you'll get them in pint polythene bags, which is that. What I do when I get them home, I transfer them from the bags into a polythene tub like this. I then add a piece of polythene sheeting, an airtight lid on the top, and that will keep casters up to a week. Keep them in the bags and you'll get bag burn, Eventually they'll go sour and you probably get two or three days storage time at the outside. That's a good tip for prolonging casters a little bit longer. To complement the caster, I've also got with me a couple of pints of hemp seed. The one goes hand in hand with the other. I buy the hemp seed in 20 kilo bags from the local corn merchant. Uh, it cost me about a tenner, it's the cheapest way of doing it. Get some big saucepans, boil it up and then I freeze it in one pint bags. I've usually got, at any time during the summer months at least, I've usually got 10 or 12 pints in the fridge, ready and waiting. So when I come to the competition, just take it out, thaw it out, and it's ready for action. That's covered our bait. I think we'll be doing most of our fishing on the maggot today. As I said, we've got backup baits in case. Um, let's get fishing. Right, we've got our, all our tackle set up now. As you can see, everything's to hand. The first rod that I'll be using will be the 3BB float 
that we spoke about earlier. I don't use a rod dress for this sort of fishing, preferring just to drop the rest the rod onto the keep net. I'll be fishing, I'll throw the float out, I'll fire bait, the rod is there ready to pick up. My spare rod is behind me, ready to change at will. Bait is always to hand. At this point, I would point out a very useful tip for the summer months. Earlier I spoke about bait turning to casters during the summer. What I do, I carry around a shallow tray, it's off a big bait tin that I've just cut down. Any surplus bait that I don't need, I put some in the pouch. Surplus bait I keep in my keep net like that. That's floating in the water, nice and cool. It won't turn and it won't die because of direct sunlight. I don't think there's much chance of that today anyway. Our reserve bait, castor and hemp. Casters will be kept in water. This will stop them going to floating bait. Everyone, barring a couple, should be sinkers. I don't think we'll be using that, but who knows. Spare catapult. If the elastic breaks on this one, there's one in reserve. Tackle box, everything to hand. If I need to change shot in or change a hook, the trays are there. If I need to change a float or I lose a float in a tree perhaps or something like that, floats are ready to hand. So everything is ready to start fishing. Landing nets, I usually set up a bank stick in the side. Rather than have the net stuck down in the water where it could catch on underwater obstacles, I'd rather have it set up on a rod rest. So if I bring a fish, if I've got a good fish on, say a big chub or something like that, it's a simple case of bringing it in, the nets to hand, simple process. One last thing, disgorger, always ready, at the back of the ear. Right, let's start fishing. I've actually set the rig up uh, to about four foot deep to start with. I've got three number 10 shots down the line. Uh, the hook length, as we spoke about, pound bottom, size 21 hook. What I would normally do on a swim like this, I know it's about six foot deep. So I'd start off by introducing a few loose feed offerings. Simple matter, I prefer to use the, the flatty type pouch catapult. Certain anglers prefer the pouch type. I think the flat is better. It's a simple matter then. Drop a few maggots on, aim them at the water and fire. And straight away we have dace coming up in the swim. That's a good sign. Fire some more. This could be a good day. What I do now, rather than start fishing straight away, I'll spend a few minutes just firing bait around the peg. We've got a big piece of water here. If I was in a match, the next peg would be 15, 20 yards below me. There's a lot of fish, perhaps all around this area. I'll fire bait a little bit down the swim. Not so much action there. A little bit up the swim. And it would appear that's where the bulk of the dace are. As I fire the bait in, I can see a few swirls on the top of the water. Yes, there's plenty out there. Let's, let's start fishing. The rig, I've set it four foot deep, with three number 10 shots down. We've got the other three number eights in reserve if we need to go deeper later. I'm gonna start off fishing. There's several different ways of catching dace. Um, sometimes you can catch them off the surface of the water. Other times you have to read the float down on the insert and get bites actually registering on the float. This type of rig, We'll cover all eventualities of that. Uh, first and foremost, I'm going to try and catch off the surface. I'm going to do two different themes on the, on the method and see how it goes. Sort a decent maggot out for the hook. Right, the first method I tend to use, I know there's a few fish surfacing out there. I fire bait and draw the float back in amongst the feeding fish. There's lots of fish out there swirling on the top now. I had a bite then. You can't beat close face reels for this sort of fishing. If you, if you had an open face reel, you'd be forever opening and closing, opening and closing. Whereas with this type, 
It's, you're just constantly just clicking the button, let, releasing the line, picking it up off the handle, etc. Out again. Cast first, then feed. I know there's a lot of fish. I'm spraying maggots right across the river now. I'm drawing back in amongst the swirling fish. And there's a fish. Oh, it's come off. I sometimes do. That's three bites of me so far. Good start. I think the bait's damaged. I'll just check it. Yeah, maggots absolutely obliterated on the end. I'm going to try now. I know it's a bit early. I've only had sort of three or four casts so far. I'm actually going to bait the hook first. Drop it in the edge of the water. And actually fire my bait out first. Those basically, when they get fish on the top of the water, that's the two methods that you use for dace fishing. You either put the float out first and feed and draw back into it, or feed and throw the float into the bait. I'm going to put a fair bit in because there's plenty of fish on the top there now. I must catch a few. Yeah, we got one. That literally took something like half a second within the bait hitting the surface of the water. It's either a bleak or a dace, it's a small dace. Lots and lots of dace in this river in the Warwickshire Haven at the moment. Remember several years ago I fished um, a Courage qualifying match on Eversham Town Waters. And that particular day was the day that it's tented home to me how important it was to catch dace off the top. That day I had 17 pound four ounce and I think the next best weight on conventional methods was eight pound. Since that time, whenever I get a peg like this, then I always go to town to try and catch them off the surface. I'm going to vary now the methods between feeding first and casting first. We're just going to try it and try and come up with what's the best. What I do in the early stages, if this were a match, I would actually alternate the methods of feeding within the first hour. And after a while, a pattern would emerge the actual best feeding pattern to catch the fish. Missed that one. It's very frustrating, lots of anglers of meat on this river come back after a match and they complain that they've caught, say, four pound, and they estimate that they've had a bite every cast for the entire five hours of the match. I honestly believe, out in front of me now, looking at the few swirls I've seen so far, there must be, I don't know, 100, 200 pound of fish there. We only make a very, very small impression uh, on the fish that you actually catch. I'm getting a bite every cast now. They're very, very small fish, but there are some better ones in amongst them. That one come off again. If we kept having trouble with fish coming off the hook, sometimes an old angling expression that we go on about is the fish weren't having it properly. These are taking the bait correctly, but I like using barbler sucks for probably 90% of the fishing I do. Odd days when the fish do start to come off, then I would change the hook and go to a, a micro barb pattern. Camasan or the Drennan carbon match bean, probably the best. That's a better fish. The beauty of using a splice tip rod like this one. The fine carbon tip on the end actually absorbs any pressure on the strike. Now for instance, that's a nice dace, that's, that's three or four ounce. If I was using a very stiff action rod, and for instance a shoulder chub moved into the swim, the rod would actually break the hook length. It's only a pound breaking strain. I'm striking hard because the fast biting fish. If a chub should happen to come along, now a three pound chub is one hell of a bonus. If that comes along and I'm striking hard, all of a sudden, a stiff rod will break the hook length. That's why I use a splice tip. I'm enjoying this. Just after these first few casts, I think it's pretty apparent that we're going to end up with a good weight today. The secret of dace fishing is to spend plenty of time in the water. There's another one. I've gone through a little bit the way we feed. That come off. I mean, this can happen. It can come. These fish are flashing and twisting and turning about in the water all the time. <clears throat> these barbless hooks are perfect. I've only recently had these from Mustad. 
lovely little hook doesn't damage the bait just took it just about nick it through the back end of the skin if i was a fish i couldn't resist that that's your casting technique that i employ today it's a bit windy so i'm actually sort of sweeping the the rod back over my head and forcing it out the wind also gets the hook in your jumping out again there's two methods of casting a float like this one is to grip the maggot just beneath your finger and thumb and bring the rod up to the vertical put a little bit of flex into the rod and cast out like that just go through it again hold the hook base just just on top of the hook bring the rod back and force it forward as the float's about to hit the water, just check it slightly. If you're on an open face reel, just on the lip. On a close face, obviously, just behind the button. By doing that, the bait will land in a complete line out in front of you. There'll be no tangles. That's the best way of doing it. If conditions allow, and we haven't got trees around us, unfortunately, like today's peg, I would actually employ the overhead cast. By doing that, it allows me to use a lighter float than I would need under these conditions if trees were around me. All you do, you reel the, the float up to the rod, it's three or four foot away, sweep it back, cast. Again, as it's about to hit the water, just, just check it with your finger. Some people prefer that one. I prefer that one. The choice is yours. Just go through that again. Every time you bring the bait back in, Especially when you're dace fishing, it's always worthwhile to check the bait. If you notice on that bait there, the end of the bait is damaged. That means a bleak or a tiny dace has took it just below the surface, perhaps it missed a bite or, or whatever. It's worth checking it because any self-respecting fish wouldn't want a bait like that. Sort of decent maggot house. Just nick it through. back, cast it out, take up the slack line, press the button. You'll know everything's to hand. If I get a bite as I'm about to pick my catapult up, it's just a simple case of picking the rod up and I'm into the fish. I'm going to try it one more time this way round. I've got one. I love catching dace. I think out of all the species that swim, roach are my favourites. But this style of fishing, it only lasts during the summer months. Lovely, lovely little fish. That's an ounce and a half, two ounce, two ounce a piece. It doesn't take long to build up a weight of fish for catching that fast. I say I prefer roach, but we tend to catch mo mostly roach bags in the winter months. Maggie on again, this time. I'm going to drop it in the side, rod right on the keep net. Plenty of bait now, we've established that there's, there's a lot of fish out there. So I mean I've got something like 50 or 60 maggots. I'm actually shooting them right the way across the river and there's fish boiling everywhere. Overhead cast again. And one straight away. This is great. I wish this was a match. I've only ever drawn this peg once in a match. It was a little bit different. It was like it was last season and it was um, in September. It was an Angling Times match and that particular day there was, there was no action at all off Little Fish on the top. Every peg was taken uh, and actually won that day with I think in the region about 21 pound of chub. It sounds a good weight and I suppose on paper it is, but that particular day, that, that 21 pound is only made up of about 12 or 13 fish. So you know, over the course of five hours, or oh, bump one then, over the course of five hours, it wasn't many bites. I'd rather have it like this. I'd rather build up lots and lots of, of small fish and take it from there. I'm hoping that today, as the, as the session goes on, that a few chub might move in. At the moment, 
there's not really much chance of catching a chub because there's that much surface activity off the dace that the chub, quite honestly, aren't getting the look in. Something that's worth mentioning at this stage, whenever I'm catching fish at a certain depth, what I tend to do is measure against the rod the actual depth that I've been catching the fish at. It achieves a couple of things. Quite often during a match, you might be fishing a peg 10, 12 foot deep and catching sometimes at mid-water. During the course of the match, we're going to change our depths. We're going to experiment with different depths when the fish have gone off. And we might want to come back to the original depth set and it might well be that that was the depth that we should have fished all day long. Now, rather than try and think, well, was I, was I at four foot, was I at six foot or whatever, I'd normally measure off against a rod ring. If you're fishing deep, measure it against, hold the hook against the butt of the rod and measure up what particular ring it comes to based on the top joint, the middle joint or whatever. Obviously for this sort of depth, I normally hold it roughly against the reel. I know it's about the fourth, about the fifth ring up. Give or take a couple of inches. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to try and catch a little bit higher up in the water. All the bait I've been putting in, lots of fish have been swirling about on the top. Go back to our original bulk rig. I'm going to slide the three number eights down to meet up with the first number ten. The BB shot, again this stuff is absolutely marvellous. You can actually bite it on and it still moves better than lead. It's a little bit bigger but I don't think the fish mind that. Slide it down, slide it down again. We've got a mental note of the depth that we were at. If this doesn't work, and it doesn't always, we can always go back to the original depth we fished at. All we've got now is a rig, roughly three foot deep. All the, all the bulk shot now is around the float, barring one number 10 that's actually at mid depth. It's just above the hook length knot. I'm gonna try it at this. Uh, the feeding routine I'm gonna use is to feed the bait first, and cast this in amongst it. Let's see how it goes. Plenty of maggots. Yep, they're still out there. Oh, I missed a bite straight away. Sometimes, even though the fish are shallow in the water, it's best to have it a deeper rig set up. What's happening here, I think, it might work, but I think what's happening here is the fish are taking the bait so quickly, they're feeling the resistance of the float. What's happening, they're grabbing the bait as it hits the surface, they're feeling that straight away and dropping the bait as a consequence. Whereas by having the, the float set deeper, quite often it gives us a little bit more of a chance of hitting the fish because they felt less resistance and more slack line. We'll try it then. I'm varying all the time now between casting first and feeding first. I think the best pattern so far has been to feed first and then cast into it. It doesn't take too long. When you've had a fair bit of experience on dice fishing of this sort, it doesn't take long to work out whether the fish want it presented very shallow. When we catch chub on here, sometimes the fish will come right up in the water and we'd actually fish that deep. In fact, further downstream, down towards Eversham, I've known times where we've caught this deep in 12 or 14 feet of water. It doesn't happen so much these days, but on the days that it does, you must recognise the signs and change your depths accordingly, because the man that fishes 12 foot deep it's going to miss out on an awful lot of action and ultimately a lot of prize money at the end of the match. This isn't working. I'm going to give it one more cast and then if I don't catch on this, oh I've got one. It's always the case, I'll give it one more cast and you get one and then you're stuck with this for a bit. It's a better fish, it's a nice dace. Beautiful fish. In amongst the shoal of fish out there at the moment there is also a lot of bleak. Bleak are totally different, chub, uh, dace rather, are quite a fat fish, under slung mouth, nice bluey colouring on the back. 
generally, if you got a bleak that big, it would be a specimen anyway. We'll give this rig another another try. Mag it on. Out. What I'm doing at the moment, I'm, I'm casting way over where the actual bait is landing. And I'm just drawing back in, in amongst the feeding fish. But I'm not hitting as many as I hoped. The bites are so fast. No, it's no good. I could continue to fish like this for quite some time and I would pick odd fish up, but I'm losing the, uh, the rhythm that I had earlier. So I'm gonna go back to the deeper type rig, mag it on. Bulk shot moved up. So there's so much variation with a, with a rig like this. I can, for instance, and I think I will, fish with two shots booked together. I've now got, at mid depth, or just above mid depth, two number 10s together, and one number 10 on the hook length. I can have so many variations, I can bring it all down and have a bulker shot just above the hook length if I want to. Experimentation is the key word, I think, with this one. Eventually, I mean, five hours is quite a long time in a competition. When I'm practicing, like today, I'm looking to build up a swim over a five hour period. There's a fish. Now that took something like two or three seconds to get the bite. It's actually registered on the float, that one. Another small dace. Great to see these fish. I'm a bit concerned about pollution on this river. I re read a report recently in the Times about sewerage and effluent and pesticides and all this that's going in. And it, and it was frightening reading, but seeing this, the size of the fish that I'm catching today, then it looks good for the future. I just hope that pollution is, uh, is fought against strongly. I'm a member of the, the ACA, that's the Anglers Cooperative Association. They are probably, as anglers, our biggest ally in fishing. And I strongly recommend anybody to join them. It's about £5 a year membership. You can pay more if you want to. I strongly urge you to do so. And they will actually represent us, the anglers, in any pollution cases. They haven't got many funds apart from what we put in. So we urge everybody to join. What I have noticed over the last few casts, the surface activity has stopped rather. What I'm going to try to do now, I'm going to first of all deepen off on this rig and then I'm going to perhaps twitch over to the other rig a bit later on in the hope of catching a few chub. I know this chub live here and it might well be that the chub have moved in and pushed the dice out a little bit as well. Let's try it. Oh, there's one on there. I'm going to deepen off anyway and give it a try. That's a bleak. Very similar in appearance to a, to a dace, but they don't grow much bigger than that. They've got a greeny band down on the top, the very frisky fish, underslung mouth again. Right, let's change the rig around a little. I'm going to go two foot deeper. And I'm going to move two of the extra three number eights that we had with the bulk shot down to form a very small bulk at mid depth. That is one problem with the River Avon during the summer months. We get lots of boats. I think sometimes anglers are more put off than the fish are. But you do get certain occasions where it gets a little bit impossible to fish. You get a procession coming through, the bottom's churning up all the time. It's a bit frustrating sometimes when you get fish settled and that sort of thing happens, and you might get one through after another after another, and the weights are thus reduced. What I've actually got now, I've deepened off, I'm measuring up again on the rod rings. I've got a bulk at mid depth, four number eights, sorry, three number eights and a number ten, and a number ten on the hook length. Let's give this a try.
When this rig goes in, there's a lot more float sticking out to start with. The bulk will actually register on the insert, pulling it straight down, and the number 10 will pull it that little bit further. What we're looking for with this quite often is, there's a bite then, is the actual bulk to register, and the last number 10 can either be lifted up by the fish or followed through. And by that, if they follow through with it, you actually get a bite register on the float, pulling it under. If they actually hold the shot up, that will lift the float up in the air. I've got a feeling there's some chub here somewhere. Oh, I can't catch on this one at all. It quite often happens during the course of a, of a five hour match. For a variety of reasons, you could have a, sh a shoulder chub move into the swim, move the dace out. You could have a pike in the swim, uh, boat disturbance, or you could have simply caught so many fish that the dace are disturbed because of the activity. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to try and catch a few chub before I finish the session off. Um, I had a good day, I've enjoyed catching the dace, but I do like catching chub as well. I'm going to try the heavier rig with a bit of lead down. You'll notice again, everything to hand. It's obviously important, sometimes if I'm fishing matches on this river and I've got a bit of time at the start, I might even set up two or three rods the same. And the reason we do this is if you catch it on one particular method, and let's say sometimes you might have five or ten minutes left in the match, and you're getting a big tangle, and you're catching well at that stage, it's a simple matter of picking the other rod up, you've got an identical rig on it, and away you go. I can't see any point in having spare rods in the bag if you're only going to set one rod up. Because if you do get that tangle, then effectively your match is over. On this rig now, <clears throat> we've got three number eights down the line. It's a heavier float. What I'm going to do is fish a little bit further across the river because I hope that there's one or two chub knocking about over there. For chub fishing this time of year, we nearly always use double maggots. I've got a size 19 on this, so the maggots sit nicely on it. Let's give it a try tangle on the end to start with. This wind's dreadful. Now for this now I'm going to put a lot of bait in to try and induce a few chub to feed. It's getting a little bit late in the day. It's the ideal time now for chub to feed. The sun's dropped, what little sun we've had today. Is that one? No, it's a good dace though. You see again, I've struck with the rod up in the air. I'm bringing the fish back under the water until we actually see the float. It's practice, this part of it, to swing it in to hand. I wouldn't mind catching a few of them. It's a big, sometimes you, you go down in the water to get a bigger stamp of fish. As I said earlier, it's just a case of experimenting, changing your depths, changing your patterns, and eventually, at some stage, during a competition or during a pleasure session, you'll come up with the right method. Sink the line on this one. I've got a lot of bait left, so I'm going to put it in. I'm getting a situation now where I can get the float in, the shots are going down and actually present the bait as we would as if we were fishing a winter match. There is a chance now that we might get one or two chub. That's a bite. That is definitely a chub. This is a critical time now. I never bring the rod in too high. I don't want the fish splashing about on the top too much, but I know there's quite a few weeds down to the edge. A few lily pads. It's not massive. There's some very big chub on this, this area. This one's probably pound, pound and a half. It's boring deep. 
This is where it's important to have a good through action rod. <clears throat> so he's going for the snags. This is a critical time. If you give it too much now, you could lose the fish. And into the net. Summertime fish, it's about pound, pound and a bit. In the winter, and that's put weight on, we've had a lot to eat, it would probably weigh pound and three quarters. In the net. I'm going to actually try now, shallowing up a little bit on this rig. Uh, I've seen one or two swirls just over by the far bank trees from Chubb. And I hope that we can catch on that rig. It's got to be quick because I've got to go soon. We'll take that shot back up there. Two red maggots again. Line sunk. When these chub come on the feed on pegs like this, sport can be absolutely tremendous. I recall back in, in 1985, pleasure fishing this peg. I got the whole of the stretch to myself that day. And I actually caught a weighed and witnessed 118 pound of fish. Uh, that day I had fish just under the surface from rod length out right the way to the far bank of the river. Tremendous days fishing. I've never caught anything like that in a match. That's gone. That's a chub. That was right down the bottom of the peg. It's a decent fish too. I've got to watch it because there's quite a bit of weed down there. And these chub, over the course of time, get to know where weed is. And there's nothing worse I don't like losing fish any time. There's nothing worse than in a match, having that, that match winning fish on late in the session and then losing it in the weed bed. This one's come up, I think. We could be in luck. This is the critical time. This is the time that, that te tests your line to the limit. It tests whether you've tied your hooks properly. He's not ready yet. That's a gorgeous fish. That is a gorgeous fish. Come on. Ah, oh, yes. That is a lovely chub. Around about, what, pound 12? Knocking two pound, I would think. Disgorger. Little bit tatty. Um, this fish has recently spawned. A few mile upstream is a weir called Harvington. Um, what happens during the close season months, May and early June, a lot of the fish go up the stream to congregate for spawning. A little bit later on, they'll all drop back down. That's obviously one of the first that's come through. A bit of weed on the line there. I'm going to try for one or two more. I haven't got long left. I always, I'm always like this. I always catch a last fish and then... I always want another one. In fact, I can recall a lot of sessions where I promised to get back for a certain time and the last cast has gone on two or three hours. But it's such a nice night now. It's been a horrible day weather-wise. We've had wind, rain, all sorts. This is definitely going to be our last cast. I could end up here all night. Go on, go under. It's always nice to finish the session with a decent fish. Whether I'm in a match or in a pleasure fishing situation, I love getting a decent fish to finish off with. I should have finished on that, that chub that I caught. 
But you always think there's going to be one a little bit bigger. No. Well, that's it. The end of a very enjoyable session. I've thoroughly enjoyed it today. It's been interesting. I wish we could have caught a few more chub. Uh, we had plenty of dice, we had plenty of bites. In fact, I think I've probably hit, I don't know, 50% of the bites that I've had. If ever you could find a method of turning all the bites into fish, then believe me, you'd be a very rich man on this river. Anybody that's thinking of getting into match fishing, one word of advice I would give them is follow the same steps that I did a few years ago. I went through a club, a club apprenticeship, uh, I joined several clubs as a junior and progressed up through the different youth clubs etc. And I ended up fishing uh, the Opens about 12 years ago. To start with I used to concentrate on two or three venues and this I would feel is invaluable to anybody intending to get into match fishing. A venue like this, like Twyford Farm, lends itself perfectly to a variety of methods. Stick float, waggler, pole, feeder, they all play a part on certain days. So I would recommend anybody who's thinking of getting into the match fishing circles to stick to two or three venues. If you go all over the place, believe me, these days you won't win. Concentrate on three, do your apprenticeships there, and it'll help for the future. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Let's have a look what we've caught. These nets are great for fish conservation. I'd advise anybody to buy a, a keep net at least 10 or 12 feet in length. Gives the fish plenty of room to swim about in. It doesn't give them too much distress. There's a few more there than I thought. We only had the two decent chub today. I would estimate, oh, what have we got there, 12, between 12 and 14 pounds. If I was in a match, I'd probably admit to eight or nine if somebody asked me during the competition. I always tell lies during a the match. There you go. A way to fight another day. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. It's been a very interesting day's fishing, despite the conditions. We had rain, wind, all sorts today, despite, despite it's supposed to be the summer. I'd like to draw this peg again in a few weeks' time. I feel that with the practice that I've had, I could catch between 15 and 20 pounds. And who knows, a few chub moving, possibly a bit more. I hope you've learned something from our session today. If you see me on the riverbank in the future, please feel free to come and ask me any questions that you might want to know. See you soon.